Chapter twenty five part one of the Voyage Out by Virginia Wolf This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The afternoon was very hot, so hot that the breaking of the waves on the shore sounded like the repeated sigh of some exhausted creature, and even on the terrace under an awning the bricks were hot, and the air danced perpetually over the short dry grass. The red flowers in the stone basins were drooping with the heat, and the white blossoms which had been so smooth and thick only a few weeks ago were now dry, and their edges were curled and yellow. Only the stiff and hostile plants of the south, whose fleshy leaves seemed to be grown upon spines, still remained standing upright and defied the sun to beat them down. It was too hot to talk, and it was not easy to find any book that would withstand the power of the sun. Many books had been tried and then let fall, and now Terence was reading Milton aloud, because he said the words of Milton had substance and shape, so that it was not necessary to understand what he was saying. One could merely listen to his words. One could almost handle them. There is a gentle nymph not far from hence, he read, that with moist curb sways the smooth severn stream. Sabrina is her name, a virgin pure, while Om she was the daughter of Locrine, that had the sceptre from his father brute. The words, in spite of what Terence had said, seemed to be laden with meaning and perhaps it was for this reason that it was painful to listen to them. They sounded strange. They meant different things from what they usually meant. Rachel, at any rate, could not keep her attention fixed upon them, but went off upon curious trains of thought suggested by words such as curb and locrine and brute which brought unpleasant sights before her eyes independently of their meaning. Owing to the heat and the dancing air, the garden too looked strange. The trees were either too near or too far, and her head almost certainly ached. She was not quite certain, and therefore she did not know whether to tell Terence now or to let him go on reading. She decided that she would wait until he came to the end of a stanza, and if by that time she had turned her head this way and that, and it ached in every position, undoubtedly, she would say very calmly that her head ached. Sabrina, fair, listen where thou art sitting, under the glassy, cool, translucent wave, in twisted braids of lilies knitting, the loose train of thy amber dropping hair. Listen, for dear honour's sake, goddess of the silver lake. Listen and save. But her head ached. It ached whichever way she turned it. She sat up and said as she had determined, My head aches so that I shall go indoors. He was halfway through the next verse but he dropped the book instantly. Your head aches, he repeated. For a few moments they sat looking at one another in silence, holding each other's hands. During this time his sense of dismay and catastrophe were almost physically painful. All round him he seemed to hear the shiver of broken glass, which, as it fell to earth, left him sitting in the open air. But at the end of two minutes, noticing that she was not sharing his dismay, but was only rather more languid and heavy-eyed than usual, he recovered, fetched Helen, and asked her to tell him what they had better do, for Rachel had a headache. Mrs. Ambrose was not discomposed, but advised that she should go to bed and added that she must expect 
her head to ache if she sat up to all hours and went out in the heat, but a few hours in bed would cure it completely. Terence was unreasonably reassured by her words, as he had been unreasonably depressed the moment before. Helen's sense seemed to have much in common with the ruthless good sense of nature, which avenged rashness by a headache, and like nature's good sense might be depended upon. Rachel went to bed. She lay in the dark, it seemed to her, for a very long time, but at length, waking from a transparent kind of sleep, she saw the windows white in front of her, and recollected that some time before she had gone to bed with a headache, and that Helen had said it would be gone when she woke. She supposed, therefore, that she was now quite well again. At the same time the wall of her room was painfully white, and curved slightly, instead of being straight and flat. Turning her eyes to the window, she was not reassured by what she saw there. The movement of the blind as it filled with air and blew slowly out, drawing the cord with a little trailing sound along the floor, seemed to her terrifying, as if it were the movement of an animal in the room. She shut her eyes, and the pulse in her head beat so strongly that each bump seemed to tread upon a nerve piercing her forehead with a little stab of pain. It might not be the same headache, but she certainly had a headache. She turned from side to side in the hope that the coolness of the sheets would cure her, and that when she next opened her eyes to look the room would be as usual. After a considerable number of vain experiments, she resolved to put the matter beyond a doubt. She got out of bed and stood upright, holding on to the brass ball at the end of the bedstead. Ice cold at first, it soon became as hot as the palm of her hand, and as the pains in her head and body and the instability of the floor proved that it would be far more intolerable to stand and walk than to lie in bed, she got into bed again, but though the change was refreshing at first, the discomfort of bed was soon as great as the discomfort of standing up. She accepted the idea that she would have to stay in bed all day long, and as she laid her head on the pillow, relinquished the happiness of the day. When Helen came in an hour or two later, suddenly stopped her cheerful words, looked startled for a second, and then unnaturally calm. The fact that she was ill was put beyond a doubt. It was confirmed when the whole household knew of it, when the song that someone was singing in the garden stopped suddenly, and when Maria, as she brought water, slipped past the bed with averted eyes. There was all the morning to get through, and then all the afternoon, and at intervals she made an effort to cross over into the ordinary world, but she found that her heat and discomfort had put a gulf between her world and the ordinary world, which she could not bridge. At one point the door opened, and Helen came in with a little dark man who had, it was the chief thing she noticed about him, very hairy hands. She was drowsy and intolerably hot, and as he seemed shy and obsequious, she scarcely troubled to answer him, although she understood that he was a doctor. At another point the door opened and Terence came in very gently smiling too steadily, as she realized, for it to be natural. He sat down and talked to her, stroking her hands until it became irksome to her to lie any more in the same position, and she turned round 
and when she looked up again Helen was beside her, and Terence had gone. It did not matter. She would see him to-morrow when things would be ordinary again. Her chief occupation during the day was to try to remember how the lines went. Under the glassy, cool, translucent wave, in twisted braids of lilies knitting, the loose train of thy amber dropping hair. And the effort worried her because the adjectives persisted in getting into the wrong places. The second day did not differ very much from the first day, except that her bed had become very important, and the world outside, when she tried to think of it, appeared distinctly further off. The glassy, cool, translucent wave was almost visible before her, curling up at the end of the bed, and as it was refreshingly cool, she tried to keep her mind fixed upon it. Helen was here and Helen was there all day long. Sometimes she said that it was lunchtime, and sometimes that it was tea-time, but by the next day all landmarks were obliterated, and the outer world was so far away that the different sounds, such as the sounds of people moving overhead, could only be ascribed to their cause by a great effort of memory. The recollection of what she had felt, or of what she had been doing and thinking three days before, had faded entirely. On the other hand, every object in the room, and the bed itself, and her own body with its various limbs and their different sensations, were more and more important each day. She was completely cut off, and unable to communicate with the rest of the world, isolated alone with her body. Hours and hours would pass thus, without getting any further through the morning, or again a few minutes would lead from broad daylight to the depths of the night. One evening when the room appeared very dim, either because it was evening or because the blinds were drawn, Helen said to her, Someone is going to sit here tonight. You won't mind. Opening her eyes, Rachel saw not only Helen, but a nurse in spectacles, whose face vaguely recalled something that she had once seen. She had seen her in the chapel, Nurse McInnes, said Helen, and the nurse smiled steadily, as they all did, and said that she did not find many people who were frightened of her. After waiting for a moment, they both disappeared, and having turned on her pillow, Rachel woke to find herself in the midst of one of those interminable nights which do not end at twelve, but go on into the double figures, thirteen, fourteen, and so on, until they reach the twenties, and then the thirties, and then the forties. She realized that there is nothing to prevent knights from doing this if they chose. At a great distance an elderly woman sat with her head bent down. Rachel raised herself slightly and saw with dismay that she was playing cards by the light of a candle which stood in the hollow of a newspaper. The sight had something inexplicably sinister about it and she was terrified and cried out, upon which the woman laid down her cards and came across the room, shading the candle with her hands. Coming nearer and nearer across the great space of the room, she stood at last above Rachel's head and said, Not asleep? Let me make you comfortable. She put down the candle and began to arrange the bedclothes, it struck Rachel that a woman who sat playing cards in a cavern all night long would have very cold hands, 
and she shrunk from the touch of them. "'Why, there's a toe all the way down there,' the woman said, proceeding to tuck in the bedclothes. Rachel did not realise that the toe was hers. "'You must try to lie still,' she proceeded, "'because if you lie still you will be less hot, and if you toss about you will make yourself more hot, and we don't want you to be any hotter than you are. She stood looking down upon Rachel for an enormous length of time. And the quieter you lie, the sooner you will be well, she repeated. Rachel kept her eyes fixed upon the peaked shadow on the ceiling, and all her energy was concentrated upon the desire that this shadow should move. But the shadow and the woman seemed to be eternally fixed above her. She shut her eyes. When she opened them again, several more hours had passed, but the night still lasted interminably. The woman was still playing cards, only she sat now in a tunnel under a river, and the light stood in a little archway in the wall above her. She cried, Terence, and the peaked shadow again moved across the ceiling, as the woman with an enormous slow movement rose, and they both stood still above her. It's just as difficult to keep you in bed as it was to keep Mr. Forrest in bed, the woman said, and he was such a tall gentleman. In order to get rid of this terrible stationary sight, Rachel again shut her eyes, and found herself walking through a tunnel under the Thames, where there were little deformed women sitting in archways playing cards while the bricks of which the wall was made oozed with damp, which collected into drops and slid down the wall. But the little old women became Helen and Nurse McGuinness after a time, standing in the window together, whispering, whispering incessantly. Meanwhile, outside her room, the sounds, the movements and the lives of the other people in the house went on in the ordinary light of the sun throughout the usual succession of hours. When, on the first day of her illness, it became clear that she would not be absolutely well, for her temperature was very high, until Friday, that day being Tuesday, Terence was filled with resentment not against her, but against the force outside them, which was separating them. He counted up the number of days that would almost certainly be spoilt for them. He realized with an odd mixture of pleasure and annoyance that, for the first time in his life, he was so dependent upon another person that his happiness was in her keeping. The days were completely wasted upon trifling, immaterial things, for after three weeks of such intimacy and intensity, all the usual occupations were unbearably flat and beside the point. The least intolerable occupation was to talk to St. John about Rachel's illness, and to discuss every symptom and its meaning, and when this subject was exhausted, to discuss illness of all kinds, and what caused them, and what cured them. Twice every day he went in to sit with Rachel, and twice every day the same thing happened. On going into her room, which was not very dark, where the music was lying about as usual, and her books and letters, his spirits rose instantly. When he saw her he felt completely reassured. She did not look very ill. Sitting by her side he would tell her what he had been doing, using his natural voice to speak to her, only a few tones lower down than usual. 
but by the time he had sat there for five minutes he was plunged into the deepest gloom. She was not the same. He could not bring them back to their old relationship. But although he knew that it was foolish, he could not prevent himself from endeavouring to bring her back, to make her remember, and when this failed, he was in despair. He always concluded as he left her room that it was worse to see her than not to see her. But by degrees, as the day wore on, the desire to see her returned and became almost too great to be borne. On Thursday morning, when Terence went into her room, he felt the usual increase of confidence. She turned round and made an effort to remember certain facts from the world that was so many millions of miles away. "'You have come up from the hotel?' she asked. "'No, I'm staying here for the present,' he said. "'We've just had luncheon,' he continued. "'And the mail has come in. There's a bundle of letters for you, letters from England.' Instead of saying, as he meant her to say, that she wished to see them, she said nothing for some time. "'You see, there they go, rolling off the edge of the hill,' she said suddenly. "'Rolling, Rachel? What do you see rolling? There's nothing rolling.' "'The old woman with the knife,' she replied not speaking to Terence in particular, and looking past him. As she appeared to be looking at a vase on the shelf opposite, he rose and took it down. "'Now they can't roll any more,' he said cheerfully. Nevertheless, she lay gazing at the same spot, and paid him no further attention, although he spoke to her. He became so profoundly wretched that he could not endure to sit with her, but wandered about until he found St. John, who was reading the Times in the veranda. He laid it aside patiently, and heard all that Terence had to say about delirium. He was very patient with Terence. He treated him like a child. By Friday it could not be denied that the illness was no longer an attack that would pass off in a day or two. It was a real illness that required a good deal of organization, and engrossed the attention of at least five people. But there was no reason to be anxious. Instead of lasting five days, it was going to last ten days. Rodriguez was understood to say that there were well-known varieties of this illness. Rodriguez appeared to think that they were treating the illness with undue anxiety. His visits were always marked by the same show of confidence, and in his interviews with Terence he always waved aside his anxious and minute questions with a kind of flourish which seemed to indicate that they were all taking it much too seriously. He seemed curiously unwilling to sit down. A high temperature, he said, looking furtively about the room, and appearing to be more interested in the furniture and in Helen's embroidery than in anything else. In this climate you must expect a high temperature. You need not be alarmed by that. It is the pulse we go by, he tapped his own hairy wrist, and the pulse continues excellent. Thereupon he bowed and slipped out. The interview was conducted laboriously upon both sides in French, and this, together with the fact that he was optimistic, and that Terence respected the medical profession from hearsay, made him less critical than he would have been had he encountered the doctor in any other capacity. Unconsciously he took Rodriguez's side against Helen, who seemed to have taken an unreasonable prejudice against him. When Saturday came, 
it was evident that the hours of the day must be more strictly organized than they had been. St. John offered his services. He said that he had nothing to do, and that he might as well spend the day at the villa if he could be of use. As if they were starting on a difficult expedition together, they parcelled out their duties between them, writing out an elaborate scheme of hours upon a large sheet of paper which was pinned to the drawing-room door. Their distance from the town, and the difficulty of procuring rare things with unknown names from the most unexpected places, made it necessary to think very carefully, and they found it unexpectedly difficult to do the simple but practical things that were required of them as if they, being very tall, were asked to stoop down and arrange minute grains of sand in a pattern on the ground. It was St. John's duty to fetch what was needed from the town, so that Terence would sit all through the long hot hours alone in the drawing-room, near the open door, listening for any movement upstairs or call from Helen. He always forgot to pull down the blinds, so that he sat in bright sunshine, which worried him without his knowing what was the cause of it. The room was terribly stiff and uncomfortable. There were hats in the chairs, and medicine bottles among the books. He tried to read, but good books were too good, and bad books were too bad and the only thing he could tolerate was the newspaper, which, with its news of London and the movements of real people who were giving dinner parties and making speeches, seemed to give a little background of reality to what was otherwise mere nightmare. Then, just as his attention was fixed on the print, a soft call would come from Helen, or Mrs. Chailey would bring in something which was wanted upstairs, and he would run up very quietly in his socks and put the jug on the little table which stood crowded with jugs and cups outside the bedroom door. Or if he could catch Helen for a moment, he would ask, How is she? Rather restless. On the whole, quieter, I think the answer would be one or the other. As usual, she seemed to reserve something which she did not say, and Terence was conscious that they disagreed, and without saying it aloud, were arguing against each other. But she was too hurried and preoccupied to talk. The strain of listening and the effort of making practical arrangements and seeing that things worked smoothly absorbed all Terence's power. Involved in this long, dreary nightmare, he did not attempt to think what it amounted to. Rachel was ill. That was all. He must see that there was medicine and milk and that things were ready when they were wanted. Thought had ceased. Life itself had come to a standstill. Sunday was rather worse than Saturday had been, simply because the strain was a little greater every day, although nothing else had changed. The separate feelings of pleasure, interest, and pain, which combined to make up the ordinary day, were merged in one long-drawn sensation of sordid misery and profound boredom. He had never been so bored since he was shut up in the nursery alone as a child. The vision of Rachel as she was now, confused and heedless, had almost obliterated the vision of her as she had been once long ago. He could hardly believe that they had ever been happy, or engaged to be married. For what were feelings? What was there to be felt? Confusion covered every sight and person. 
and he seemed to see St. John, Ridley, and the stray people who came up now and then from the hotel to inquire, through a mist. The only people who were not hidden in this mist were Helen and Rodriguez, because they could tell him something definite about Rachel. Nevertheless, the day followed the usual forms. At certain hours they went into the dining-room, and when they sat round the table they talked about indifferent things. St. John usually made it his business to start the talk and to keep it from dying out. "'I've discovered the way to get Sancho past the White House,' said St. John on Sunday at luncheon. "'You crackle a piece of paper in his ear.' Then he bolts for about a hundred yards, but he goes on quite well after that. Yes, but he wants corn. You should see that he has corn. I don't think much of the stuff they give him, and Angelo seems a dirty little rascal. There was then a long silence. Ridley murmured a few lines of poetry under his breath and remarked, as if to conceal the fact that he had done so, very hot today. Two degrees higher than it was yesterday, said St. John. I wonder where these nuts come from, he observed, taking a nut out of the plate, turning it over in his fingers, and looking at it curiously. London, I should think, said Terence, looking at the nut too. A competent man of business could make a fortune here in no time, St. John continued. I suppose the heat does something funny to people's brains. Even the English go a little queer. Anyhow, they're hopeless people to deal with. They kept me three quarters of an hour waiting at the chemist's this morning, for no reason whatever. There was another long pause. Then Ridley inquired, Rodriguez seems satisfied? Quite, said Terence with decision. It's just got to run its course. Whereupon Ridley heaved a deep sigh. He was genuinely sorry for everyone, but at the same time he missed Helen considerably and was a little aggrieved by the constant presence of the two young men. They moved back into the drawing-room. "'Look here, Hurst,' said Terence. "'There's nothing to be done for two hours.' He consulted the sheet pinned to the door. "'You go and lie down. I'll wait here.' Chailey sits with Rachel while Helen has her luncheon. It was asking a good deal of Hurst to tell him to go without waiting for a sight of Helen. These little glimpses of Helen were the only respites from strain and boredom, and very often they seemed to make up for the discomfort of the day, although she might not have anything to tell them. However, as they were on an expedition together, he had made up his mind to obey. Helen was very late in coming down. She looked like a person who has been sitting for a long time in the dark. She was pale and thinner, and the expression of her eyes was harassed but determined. She ate her luncheon quickly and seemed indifferent to what she was doing. She brushed aside Terence's inquiries, and at last, as if he had not spoken, she looked at him with a slight frown and said, "'We can't go on like this, Terence. Either you've got to find another doctor, or you must tell Rodriguez to stop coming, and I'll manage for myself. It's no use for him to say that Rachel's better. She's not better. She's worse.' Terence suffered a terrific shock like that which he had suffered when Rachel said, My head aches. He stilled it by reflecting that Helen was overwrought, and he was upheld in this opinion by his obstinate sense that she was opposed to him in the argument. 
Do you think she's in danger? he asked. No one can go on being as ill as that day after day, Helen replied. She looked at him and spoke as if she felt some indignation with somebody. Very well. I'll talk to Rodriguez this afternoon, he replied. Helen went upstairs at once. Nothing could now assuage Terence's anxiety. He could not read, nor could he sit still, and his sense of security was shaken, in spite of the fact that he was determined that Helen was exaggerating, and that Rachel was not very ill. But he wanted a third person to confirm him in his belief. Directly Rodriguez came down, he demanded. Well, how is she? Do you think her worse? There is no reason for anxiety, I tell you, none, Rodriguez replied in his execrable French, smiling uneasily and making little movements all the time as if to get away. Hewitt stood firmly between him and the door. He was determined to see for himself what kind of man he was. His confidence in the man vanished as he looked at him and saw his insignificance, his dirty appearance, his shiftiness, and his unintelligent, hairy face. It was strange that he had never seen this before. You won't object, of course, if we ask you to consult another doctor, he continued. At this the little man became openly incensed. Ah, he cried, you have not confidence in me. You object to my treatment? You wish me to give up the case? Not at all, Terence replied. But in serious illness of this kind... Rodriguez shrugged his shoulders. It is not serious, I assure you. You are over-anxious. The young lady is not seriously ill, and I am a doctor. The lady, of course, is frightened, he sneered. I understand that perfectly. The name and address of the doctor is, Terence continued. There is no other doctor. Rodriguez replied sullenly. Everyone has confidence in me. Look, I will show you. He took out a packet of old letters and began turning them over as if in search of one that would confute Terence's suspicions. As he searched, he began to tell a story about an English lord who had trusted him, a great English lord whose name he had, unfortunately, forgotten. There is no other doctor in the place, he concluded, still turning over the letters. Never mind, said Terence shortly. I will make inquiries for myself. Rodriguez put the letters back in his pocket. Very well, he remarked. I have no objection. He lifted his eyebrows shrugged his shoulders, as if to repeat that they took the illness much too seriously, and that there was no other doctor, and slipped out, leaving behind him an impression that he was conscious that he was distrusted, and that his malice was aroused. After this Terence could no longer stay downstairs. He went up, knocked at Rachel's door, and asked Helen whether he might see her for a few minutes. He had not seen her yesterday. She made no objection, and went and sat at a table in the window. Tarrant sat down by the bedside. Rachel's face was changed. She looked as though she were entirely concentrated upon the effort of keeping alive. Her lips were drawn and her cheeks were sunken and flushed, though without colour. Her eyes were not entirely shut, the lower half of the white part showing, not as if she saw, but as if they remained open because she was too much exhausted to close them. She opened them completely when he kissed her, but she only saw an old woman 
slicing a man's head off with a knife. "'There it falls,' she murmured. She then turned to Terence and asked him anxiously some question about a man with mules, which he could not understand. "'Why doesn't he come? Why doesn't he come?' she repeated. He was appalled to think of the dirty little man downstairs in connection with illness like this, and turned instinctively to Helen. But she was doing something at a table in the window, and did not seem to realize how great the shock to him must be. He rose to go, for he could not endure to listen any longer. His heart beat quickly and painfully with anger and misery. As he passed Helen she asked him in the same weary, unnatural but determined voice to fetch her more ice and to have the jug outside filled with fresh milk. When he had done these errands he went to find Hurst. Exhausted and very hot, St. John had fallen asleep on a bed, but Terence woke him without scruple. Helen thinks she's worse, he said. There's no doubt she's frightfully ill. Rodriguez is useless. We must get another doctor. But there is no other doctor, said Hurst drowsily, sitting up and rubbing his eyes. Don't be a damned fool, Terence exclaimed. Of course there's another doctor, and if there isn't, you've got to find one. It ought to have been done days ago. I'm going down to saddle the horse. He could not stay still in one place. In less than ten minutes St. John was riding to the town in the scorching heat in search of a doctor, his orders being to find one and bring him back if he had to be fetched in a special train. We ought to have done it days ago, Hewitt repeated angrily. When he went back into the drawing-room he found that Mrs. Flushing was there, standing very erect in the middle of the room, having arrived, as people did in these days, by the kitchen or through the garden unannounced. She's better? Mrs. Flushing inquired abruptly. They did not attempt to shake hands. No, said Terence, if anything, they think she's worse. Mrs. Flushing seemed to consider for a moment or two, looking straight at Terence all the time. Let me tell you, she said, speaking in nervous jerks. It's always about the seventh day one begins to get anxious. I dare say you've been sitting here worrying by yourself. You think she's bad, but anyone coming with a fresh eye would see she was better. Mr. Elliot's had fever. He's all right now, she threw out. It wasn't anything she caught on the expedition. What's it matter? A few days fever. My brother had fever for twenty-six days once and in a week or two he was up and about. We gave him nothing but milk and arrowroot. Here Mrs. Chailey came in with a message. I'm wanted upstairs, said Terence. You'll see. She'll be better, Mrs. Flushing jerked out as he left the room. Her anxiety to persuade Terence was very great and when he left her without saying anything she felt dissatisfied and restless. She did not like to stay, but she could not bear to go. She wandered from room to room, looking for someone to talk to, but all the rooms were empty. End of chapter 25 part 1